and I'm struggling here today. <laughs> so last week, I made this mental note to myself not to drop this clicker, and I already failed. <laughs> OK, so if you've been following along in online and in person, we've been talking about walking by faith. And thank you, Keaton, for putting up this logo for us. It's not working. There it is. So this week, our focus of study is faith by Abram and Sarah. But today, most of the study will be on Abram. We'll talk about Sarah a little bit, but it's primarily focused on Abram today. It's on. There it is. Okay. So this week, uh, I'll be talking about faith by Abraham and Sarah, and Matt will follow up on the 15th, and I'll come back again and present uh, faith by Moses. So let's go right ahead. Last week, we learned about Abram. And we learn about what an example he is to us. We learned in chapter 12 of Genesis that God called him to a place where he would receive his inheritance. And Abram obeyed. He had not just faith, but he had an obedient faith. We also learned that Abram, even though he was faithful, he was also a man with mistakes. He made a lot of mistakes. He was righteous, but he made mistakes. And so we learn of an account where he and Sarah travels to Egypt, and he tells Sarah to tell Pharaoh that he is uh, his sister. And so when they get to uh, Egypt, Pharaoh believes him, and he takes Sarah. And once again, God intervenes and saves Abram from that situation. And that also means that when we sin, even in our sin, God sends his son to die for us, right? Because in that, we are also saved through Jesus Christ. We also learned that last week in our study that Abram traveled from the land of Haran all the way down into Canaan. And during his time of travel, he set up tents. So he would pitch a tent here and there. And him living in the tent is a temp. We know that a tent is a temporary structure. For me, I know that when you put up a tent, eventually you put it back down. And so when Abraham was living in the tent, what that means for us is our life on here, earth is a tent for us because Earth is a bridge to our heavenly home. We also learn that Abram, when he traveled all the way down into Canaan, that he could have easily turned around, but he didn't. He resisted the urge to do so. And lastly, when Abram got to Canaan, his feet was there. But we also learned, which was the most important part of our study, that he was, in effect, looking for a heavenly home. His eyes was not set here on this earth, but rather to be with God. His heart wanted to be with God. And so today we'll continue our study, and we'll flip a page and study about a call that I think is very important that sums our study on Abram and Sarah. But before we do that, allow me to give a brief overview of some of the things that's been happening, right? There's a lot of things that's happening since chapter 12. And before we get to chapter 22, I want us to get the full picture. And so in chapter 12, we learn that Abram gets called by God, and he obeys, and he goes. In chapter 13, however, Abram journeys with Lot. And at this point in time, 
they have so much possessions, they're actually quite wealthy that the land cannot sustain them. And so Abram tells Lot, let's split. And so Lot sees the valley in the Jordan, and he says, I'm going to go to Sodom. And Abraham pitches his tent in the Oaks of Mamre. So in chapter 14 of the book of Genesis, there is a war. And we learn that there's four kings that led by a king called, I think it's uh, Ketoleoma. And he gathers his armies and he goes against the kingdoms of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I believe there's five kings. And he defeats them. When he defeats them, he takes Lot as one of the captives. And in that company, in Lot's company, one of them escapes and goes back to Abram and tells Abram. So when Abram learns of this, what does he do? In the show of God's mighty, his power and his mercy, Abraham takes 300 of his trained warriors and he drives down all the way down to, uh, he, uh, he goes down and drives the four king, kings all the way up to Damascus. He defeats them and then he saves Lot and he comes back home. So when he comes back home, what happens next? He's met with, he's, he's greeted as a hero by two kings, the king of Sodom and then also Melchizedek. So Melchizedek, in show of his appreciation, gives Abraham wine and bread and he blesses him. However, the king of, the king of, uh, the king of Sodom says, this is nothing. I have a lot. I'll give you everything that I have. And Abraham makes an interesting point. He says, I made a promise to my God to never take any possessions from a king. In that, he might say that I got my, I received my, my wealth through him. So Abraham refuses. And so in chapter 15, we learn of uh, uh, an incident where Abraham f- uh, falls into a deep sleep. And God appears to him and tells him that his descendants will be enslaved and he would lead them out. So moving further along in chapter 16, Abraham is, uh, uh, takes Hagar's wife. And this is through uh, Sarah. She conceives and she has... Ishmael. And in chapter 17, God makes a covenant with Abram. And through that, all the men in the household of Abram are circumcised. And in chapter 18, we learned about this last week, where three visitors visit Abram. And they tell him that a year from that day, that he would have a son. Sarah was listening, and she questioned it. In fact, she laughed. And in that moment, the visitors asked Sarah, why do you laugh in your heart? And in that moment, she believed. So in in chapter 19, we learn of uh, an account where Sodom was, was full of people that were committing evil acts. And so at that point, God had decided to destroy the city. And Abram pleads, and he says, God says to him, if you can find 10 people that are righteous, that I will not destroy the city. And, and so that, is, that doesn't happen, and God sends his angels to go into the city. And then when they get there, they're met with Lot. And Lot tells the angels to leave. But in a series of events the people realize that there are two mysterious beings in the city, and so they come into Lot's house asking to commit uh, unspeakable uh, evil acts with those two individuals. And so the angel strikes them with blindness, and in that moment, the angel tells Lot and his family to escape. But then as they're escaping, what happens to the wife of Lot? She turns around, because they were told not to look back, and she turns into salt. And then the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. In chapter 21, a promise is made. God makes a promise, and 
His promise is fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. And at that time, uh, Hagar and Ishmael laughs, and that makes Sarah to tell Abraham to send him away. And in that time, when they, when they are sent away, God preserves them. God tells them that through Ishmael that he would be blessed and he would father many nations. And at the same time, too, there's Abimelech, who's been also watching this magnificent and growth of Abraham, and he sees how powerful his God is. And he says, one day, his God, and through Abraham, might take my land. Because as we know, Abimelech was the king in Canaan at the time. And so he makes a treaty with Abram. And Abram, on that day, plants a tamarisk tree. And they have a peace treaty. So now we have a picture. We understand what's happening. And so in chapter 22 is where our focus of our study is today. Does anybody have any questions, any comments to add? So, in, in, and, and all along also, we know that Abraham was tried. Uh, he went through a test. And when God asked him to leave his home, what did he do? He obeyed, and he, and he went out and did as God's commanded. And also, when he was tested, when Sarah demanded Hagar to be cast out, he also obeyed God's command. So if you would, would you please turn with me to Hebrews 11, 19, uh, 17 through 19. And I'll read. It says, by faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So that's a lot there to unpack. And so there's one thing that I want us to pay attention to in the first, ver in the first instance of this verse when he says, by faith, Abraham was tested. So I want us to concentrate on the word tested. The word tested means to cause someone to, to make a mistake, to tempt someone as in a way to cause them to fail. But is this how this meaning being applied in this particular instance? It says, by faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Tested. Yes. Because the Bible says God himself cannot tempt anyone, um, but there were times where God tested the faith uh, to see the, how strong um, his, his people would be. That's uh, it. That was actually, thank you, Logan, that was a point that I was trying to get to, is because the way the Hebrew writer uses tested here is not in a way to cause someone to sin, as we see in Matthew 4.1 where Jesus Christ is tempted. When Jesus Christ is tempted in Matthew 4.1, the basis of that temptation was to see if he would fail. But God, in this particular in, in, instant, the Hebrew writer is saying that when Abram was tested, it was not as if he was testing Abraham to see if he would fail, but rather to see if Abraham truly believed. But if Abraham truly had faith in God. And so, where, where do we see this? record of, of Abram being tested. Where do we see this account of his, this last trial? And that is Genesis 22, 1 through 14. Can I have someone read Genesis 22, 1 through 14, please? After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. 
Then Abraham said to his young man, Men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on, his, on Isaac his son. And he took the hand in his hand the fire and the knife, and they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. And they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And the an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Thank you, Logan. So we see this account of Abraham being tested. And some might say it's an ultimate test of faith, right? But Abraham once again obeys, and he does exactly as God had commanded him to. And while he was about to strike down his son, whom he loves, God intervenes and saves Isaac. And he provides a ram who is used as a sacrifice. But I wanna, I wanna concentrate on the part that says that Abraham journeyed for three days and he journeyed on a donkey. So I want, I, actually, not that I wanted to prove this wrong, but I did some research and I wanted to know how long it takes a donkey to travel a day. So according to Google, it takes a donkey about 20 miles. <laughs> it can travel 20 miles a day. And so from, and in, in verse 21 of, of uh, Genesis, it says that Abram at that time was in Beersheba. And so Abram travels 20 miles approximately a day and gets to Mount Moriah. Now there's a significance here that I want us to keep in the back of my mind. And it's in that Abraham gets to Mount Moriah and this mount sits at a pinnacle. And what that mount represents is the same city that it is, that is Jerusalem. That mount is that same mount that Jesus Christ was killed. That mount is that same mount that Jesus Christ would die. It's the same mount that Jesus Christ would also rise. In Chronicles, I believe, um, sorry, Solomon and, and David actually built a temple for God on that mount. Isn't that amazing? That on three days, Abram travels and he gets to this mount and he's supposed to sacrifice his son. That day, Isaac is, is saved. But when God sends his son on that third day, his son dies. But he dies for our sins. So I want us to keep that in mind. So in my research, I found something that is Mount Moriah today, which is Jerusalem. Okay, so. so I want to go back in, uh, into verse 17. It says, offered up Isaac. So the word offered up, what is offered up? In, in the Greek language, offered up means prospero. I think I spe spelled wrong. It's prospero, which means the act of bringing to. So he says in this, the writer says, Abram offered up Isaac. And we just learned that in Genesis 22 that he didn't actually offer up Isaac, did he? Did he? He did it. But in this instance, it says he offered up Isaac. What is he referring to? Because when God commanded Abraham to go and offer up his son, in his mind, Isaac was already dead. 
In his mind, he was going to do it. And so when offer, and the author says he offered up Isaac, he's saying to us that in the mind of Abraham, when God told him to do it, he had already decided to obey God. But it's used twice. And then in the second instance, it says, and he who had received the promises. Now, we know that Abraham receives the promises, but he dies, and then his promises is still fulfilled by God. And so it says, he who had received the promises in the act of offering up his son. Why? It's, and it's, so once again, it's, it's offered, is used again. It's used in that same instance to mean that this time, while he was in the process of offering up his son, God intervenes. So I, I hope you can see that parallel there. So moving further along in verse 18, it says, Of whom it said, through Isaac shall your offsprings be named. So once again, I want us to concentrate on the word offspring. Is he referring to uh, uh, verse 11, uh, Hebrews 11, 11, where it says, By faith Sarah had the strength to conceive. Is he referring to, that, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to Isaac in that particular instance in this verse? Who is offering, the offspring being referred to in this particular text? Abraham. Yes, the descendants of Abram. That's correct. So when he says, of whom it was said through Isaac, your offspring, he's saying the descendants of Abram be named. Because the Greek word offspring means sperma, means seed. So he's not talking about the seed of Isaac in this particular instant, which is singular, he's talking about the plural, the nation of Israel. So moving further along. And so we get to Hebrews eleven nineteen, and it says, he considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead, which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Excuse me. So, once again, when Abram is told by God to journey to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, he doesn't question it, and he does it. Now imagine this, a father and his son traveling for three days, and Abram provides with his, with his son. Abraham communicates with his son in this journey. That is, to me, that is suffering, because in his mind at that point in time, Isaac was dead. He was going to do it. However, in Genesis 22, we also learned that when they got to Mount Moriah, and we learned, we know that there was two young men that was with them. And before Abraham takes Isaac, and he cuts wood, and he gives Isaac, and he goes up to the mountain, he tells the two young men, stay here. We are going to go up and worship God. And what does he say next? He'll be back. Why does he say he'll be back? He said, the boy and I will come back to you. Why is he saying that? Why does he specifically say, the boy and I will come back to you? He believed. It's almost as if Abraham in that moment knew that God, even if this sacrifice is taken he believed in God so much. He had so much faith in God, in the promise of God, because all along in this series, we also want to emphasize the promise of God. So in that moment, Abraham believed that if this sacrifice takes place, that God would raise him up. Because who is the promise supposed to be fulfilled through? Isaac. So... Abraham, in his mind, knows God is faithful, and he is going to fulfill his promise. Isn't that amazing? Yes. You know, so many dimensions. You've already covered a lot. He'd gone, he left his home in Haran, mm -hmm. right, and came because God would make him a great nation. Yes. So he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. And then finally, Sarah gets impatient and convinces him to 
you know, take Hagar. Hagar. So he has uh, Ishmael. <laughs> Ishmael grows up, and then finally the promise of Isaac comes. <laughs> and then right before this, God, Sarah wants to get rid of Ishmael, and so uh, God comes to him and says, it's okay. I know you're, you're broken up about Ishmael, but you're the promises in Isaac. Yes. And right after that, he goes to offer, after Ishmael's already gone, now he's offering up Isaac. It's just, it's, it's a little bit unbelievable. It but, is. But he did. And I also want to add to that because Abraham also had sons. Isaac was not the only son. But in this, in our uh, uh, particular study, it says the son who he loved, his only son. Why is he the only son? Because Isaac was whom the promise was to be fulfilled and not through Ishmael. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, thank you, Matt. So going back to verse 19, there's another point that I want us to uh, make, and that is during that time, there was this deed that was being done. And that is in Ur and Canaan, there was a history of sacrificing their babies to false gods. So once again, when Abraham received the call to go into the uh, land of Moriah and, and offer up Isaac, he thinks that, wait a minute, this is something that is a pattern. Maybe my God is, is a God that endorses child sacrifice. But God does not endorse child sacrifice. And we learn of this in Levit Leviticus 22 uh, and Jeremiah 32, 35. God does not endorse child sacrifice. Why? Because at that very moment when Abram was about to struck his son, he intervenes. God went through this trial to show Abram that he does not endorse child sacrifice. He is a God that is different from the false gods that we know were polluting the world at the time. And so once again, uh, I think we already covered this, when Isaac inquired that, uh, they, what they sacrificed that day, what did Abram say? He said, what, what did, God will provide. And what does that signify? Uh, we later learn that Abraham, to his relief, names that mount. Does anybody know what he names that mount? Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Does anybody have any comments, thoughts? Any comments and thoughts? Jehovah Jireh, but right before, I can't remember what verse, but right before, uh, Isaac says, Dad, basically, Dad, we've got the wood, <laughs> we've got the fire, but where's the offering? And, and Abraham says, the Lord will provide. Yes. And he did. And, he did. And, 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 and I think that is a testament of the God that we, we serve. If you put your faith in God, if you, if you believe in God, he would provide. He would find a way to get you through our situation, whatever, however hard it may seem. And, yes? It's also interesting that when you think about Abraham, uh, Isaac, we always picture him as being a little toddler, little boy walking with his father. Yes. But he wasn't. He was much older. Yes. So he had an understanding of what was going on. <laughs> I think, I think at right that time, he was about 17, 18. Yes. So he, he could have easily picked up his dad and say, you know what? <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> 17 year old and 117 old man it's not that's unfair that was that, was, that would be unfair so I, I think if it was me i don't know what i would do so any more comments yes yes and and in the same way when he was traveling to canaan he never resist resisted the urge to go back so, and it's, it's a beautiful display of the faith that Abraham had in God. And also the, how, how much of an example it is to us because when we go through trials, 
It's, it's not that God wants to, God uh, uh, enjoy to see us go through trials and, and fail. He wants for us to see for ourselves if we truly believe him. And so when you think about, and I want to make this account, Peter, I'm not saying Peter didn't believe or he didn't have faith. He did. But during the, the, the moments that Jesus Christ, the last moments of his life, Peter told Jesus Christ that he would never deny him. And so when the trial comes, when the time comes when you're being tested, how would you react? And when that moment came, Peter, in fact, when his life was on the line, what did he do? He denied Jesus how many times? Three times. And so I think that is an example for us. When we leave here, I hope that I leave you with something that you can have faith in God and continue to have your faith in God throughout your walk because this is a temporary tent for us. I have a few things that I want to share before we close today, and that is real faith does not cause us to distance ourselves from God because when Abraham in his faith and in his walk, when God put him through that test and God knew his heart, not that he didn't know, because when you think about it, God already knew what Abraham was going to do. So it was for Abraham to see his measure of faith for God. I think our sufferings is an opportunity for us to remain faithful to God. When we suffer, when we go through uh, trials, it is, an, it is an opportunity for us to show God that we believe in him. And in, and, in, and in the third, we are to diligently seek God. So we see an account in Hebrews uh, 11, 6. It says, God rewards those who seek him. And lastly, the trial of Abraham convinces him about the truth of God's promises and thus establish a strong relationship with him. See, when we believe in God's promises, even when we do not know how he's going to fulfill them, that is when we demonstrate our faith in God. That is the same faith that a Hebrew writer, that Matt did an excellent job in defining for us in Hebrews 1, verse 1. So... That's all I have. Does anybody have any closing comments before we close? And I think it really honestly lines up with what Keith was talking about this morning about uh, being able to pray for God's, God's will, God's plan rather than our own. <laughs> and, you know, if, if Abraham had wanted to do things in faith but the way that he wanted to, that wasn't true faith. Yes. You know, it was being able to do it uh, the way that God had. And the, I love what Paul says, I think in Corinthians, that the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. Like the, the smartest thing we could possibly come up with and think is nothing to God. Yes. And it, it's, a, it's a alluding to Christ's sacrifice, you know, in the sense that people just could not understand how through the death of his son, he would bring about a promise. And I think that's, like you said, that's really the point to get here that we have to, the true faith Abraham had is really because he said, I don't really understand how, but I'm going to trust that you're going to bring that about, even if it means something that I don't look yes. forward to. And, we, and that's again how, how Jesus' sacrifice was. The disciples sat for three days really confused. That's right. But, you know, hopefully it, it took a little bit of seeing for them. Um, but God brought about that plan either way. Great point, Logan. I think, you know, Jesus Christ, in that moment, I think I made that point earlier where that day, Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, I think I failed today. <laughs> Abraham, that day, his son was saved. But then in Jesus Christ, when, it, when Jesus Christ, when God sent him down, he, he died for us. And so, Abraham's faith in God is, is truly a testament for us all. Thank you.